Good morning, Bread of Life Church. It is an enormous privilege to be with you this morning, even in this strange virtual way. Uh, I want to start by asking you a question. Do you remember the story of Rahab? She was the prostitute living in the walls of Jericho when the Israelites show up to inherit the land of Canaan. And she hides the Israelite spies and tells them, we are terrified because we know that God has given you the victory. So protect me and my family in exchange for protecting you. Now that may seem like a strange place to start this morning, but I want to suggest to you that this picture of Rahab gives us a glimpse of our lives, not least on this Sunday when we're celebrating the ascension of our Lord Jesus. You see, Rahab lived in a kingdom, a Canaanite kingdom. She lived in a culture and a community that had its own policies and economic practices, its own culture. And one day she looks out the window and she sees another kingdom on its way. Another kingdom with another set of norms, another set of economic practices, and she decides to transfer her citizenship from the kingdom in which she was born into the kingdom that is on the way, in part because she believes that when the dust settles, the kingdom that's coming is the one that will still be left standing. Rahab got it right. Because of her act of faith, she is received into the Israelite community, becomes a member of the community of God. More than that, she finds her way into the genealogies of the ultimate king, whose ascension we celebrate this morning, whose reign as the king of the kingdom of God we celebrate week in and week out. And what that means is that this morning, this Ascension Sunday, Rahab reminds us that you and I are in a similar position to her. Like Rahab, we were born in a kingdom. We were born in an American kingdom, or maybe you were born somewhere else, but wherever you were born, the societies that we live in have cultures and norms and economic practices and habits, and then Jesus shows up with his kingdom and forces us to choose whose side are we on? Where does our ultimate allegiance lie? And if we accept Jesus, then we become first and foremost citizens of his kingdom. And the life of discipleship then becomes learning how to answer the question, how do we live together as citizens of our new king, King Jesus? Well, our text this morning gives us one practice for citizens seeking to learn in the kingdom of live, learn to live in the kingdom of God. Uh, one practice in particular to help citizens learn to live in the economic kingdom of God, to adapt their life to the economy of the kingdom of our Lord Jesus. And I want to suggest to you this morning that as we walk through this portion of Matthew 6, we can see at least four ways that this practice, the practice of sacrificial giving, serves as a central practice of our lives as citizens of God's kingdom. First, sacrificial giving is a practice of allegiance to our king and his kingdom. Sacrificial giving, giving generously, is a way that we pledge our allegiance to King Jesus. Store up treasures in heaven, our passage begins. Invest in the kingdom, Jesus tells us. For where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. This opening idea of storing up our treasures in heaven is but one way we follow the command with which the passage ends, that we seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all shall be added unto it. You see, the text tells us that when we give generously in God's kingdom, we are pledging our allegiance. We are investing in heaven. What does it mean to store up treasures in heaven? Well, we know already from the Lord's Prayer that immediately precedes our text this morning that we have prayed to our Father who is in heaven, and we have asked our Father who is in heaven to bring his kingdom, will, and reign on earth. And so we know that heaven is the, is the place of God's presence and of his reign and his will. And so what Jesus is calling us to do is to invest our economic resources, to shift our economic resources from earthly realms where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal and shift our economic resources to the heavenly one, investing in the kingdom of God. 
seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness. And this uh, action is a pledge of allegiance, the text tells us, because there are other masters who would claim that allegiance for themselves. Verse six, chapter 6, verse 24 says, No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And what Jesus is telling us is that we have to store up our treasures in heaven. We have to invest deeply in God's kingdom as an act of allegiance to God because money itself wants our worship and claims our allegiance, seeks to claim our allegiance for itself. From the sermon's perspective, from Jesus's perspective, we're all citizens of a kingdom. In fact, as citizens, we are all slaves to a king. The only question in Jesus's mind is whether we're going to serve the king of kings, he himself, the risen and ascended one who reigns in glory, or will we serve some other idol of which the text tells us money will be one of the first idols to raise its hand and seek to claim our allegiance and enslave us to itself. So what does it mean, though, to store up treasures in heaven? What does this act of allegiance actually look like? How do we invest in God's realm, in his reign? Well, closest to hand in chapter 6, Jesus has already emphasized the importance of giving alms, that is, giving generously to the most vulnerable, the poorest in the community. And it's clear that this is one way that we store up treasures in heaven, by giving generously to the poor, because in the only other place in the gospel where Jesus uses this language of treasure in heaven, uh, it's in the context of his encounter with the rich young ruler where this wealthy young person shows up and says to Jesus, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to enter this, this citizenry of heaven, to become a citizen of the kingdom? And Jesus tells him, sell what you have and give generously to the poor, and then you will have treasure in heaven. So from Matthew's perspective, from Jesus' perspective, one of the chief ways that we pledge our allegiance to King Jesus is by generously, sacrificially giving to those who are in need. But we should not miss that storing up treasures in heaven is about more than just alms. It's more than just giving to the poor. It's also an entire way of life that reflects the generosity of our Lord and our God. It's also about an an economic way of life where we forgive debts and experience our debts being forgiven in their turn. It's about an economic way of life where Jesus says, in your meals, do not seek to gather around you the powerful who can help you climb the economic ladder. But when you throw a feast, invite those who cannot repay, the outcast, the stranger, the vulnerable, those with disabilities. Those thought sinners by others. It's about investing in a way of economic life that rejects hoarding and greed. Don't store up treasures on earth. Jesus preached in a time when there was enormous pressure on his disciples to store up treasures on earth. It's a society in which scholars tell us that more than 25% of the population would be in such deep structural poverty that they were essentially slowly dying from economic insecurity, with another quarter of the population being just barely at subsistence level and always in danger of slipping below and facing imminent sickness, famine, and death. In that context, it must have been enormously tempting to store up treasures on earth where they could be controlled by me for me and mine. But Jesus says to do that is to pledge your allegiance to money itself as an idol. Instead, Jesus says, live a life of radical generosity and open-handedness and sharing, a way of life dominated by economic practices of working and investing and sharing and giving that reflect God's own generous love. By rejecting economic injustice is and embracing a life of radical generosity, Jesus is calling God's people 
to pledge their allegiance to him as citizens of his kingdom through their sacrificial giving. So sacrificial giving is a practice of allegiance, but second, sacrificial giving is a practice that shapes our hearts for the kingdom of God. Sacrificial giving, second, is a practice that shapes our hearts for the kingdom of God. And it's so easy to miss this. Jesus tells us, store up treasures in heaven, for where your treasures are, there your heart will be also. Now, so often when we hear this, and even when we preach and teach this, we we say that what Jesus is saying is that where uh, what we do with our money shows where our heart is. In other words, we've often said that uh, if you look at your budget, you can see where your priorities are. And that's certainly true. But it's not what Jesus is saying here. In this passage, Jesus is not saying that our, um, our economic practices uh, uh, show where our hearts are. Our, our generosity is not a, um, a, a, a thermometer that reads the temperature of our hearts, our generosity is a thermostat that changes the temperature of our hearts. Jesus is not saying what you do with your stuff shows where you where your heart is. Jesus is saying what you do with your stuff affects where your heart is. Jesus is not saying that hearts that are on fire with God's kingdom will be generous. At this point, he's saying, if you obey me, if you invest in the kingdom, I will use that practice of generosity to set your hearts on fire for my kingdom. Where your treasure is, there your heart goes. Where you put your stuff, there your heart will follow. And the text goes on to tell us that where our hearts are affects how we are in the world. When our hearts are on fire with generosity, our entire bodies are full of light That's what Jesus is saying in verse 22 and 23 in what is to us kind of a strange statement about healthy eyes versus sick eyes. But scholars basically suggest that the idea here is that Jesus is saying that uh, a healthy eye is a generous eye, an eye connected to a heart fixed on God's kingdom. So what Jesus is telling us is that when we practice sacrificial generosity, That habit of investing in God's kingdom draws our hearts deeper in love for him and his kingdom. And that when we do that, we radiate that love and that light out into the world. And thus it was that Dr. King actually spoke in this exact way to say that the church should not be a thermometer that reads the temperature of the culture around it, but a thermostat that changes the temperature of the culture around it. And Jesus would certainly agree with that, that we're called to be a a, a salt and light community in the midst of the world. But what he's telling us here is we will never be that kingdom community that reflects God's reign in the midst of the kingdoms of this world, unless our hearts are shaped by the practice of radical generosity and sacrificial giving. If we don't do that, if we don't, sh- if we don't experience the, the heart-shaping uh, practice of generosity, we end up embracing the practice of serving money. And Jesus has already told us where that ends. If our primary investments are for ourselves in our earthly kingdoms, we end up serving, trying to serve God and money. And Jesus tells us when you try to do that, you end up hating and despising God. It's just a truism about who we are. Where we invest our money, our hearts and our minds follow after. And Jesus is telling us, if you want to live as a citizen of the kingdom of God, Follow me in this practice of radical sacrificial generosity. And I will use that practice to turn up the temperature of your hearts for me and for my kingdom. Third, sacrificial giving is a practice that teaches us to recognize God's good creation. Sacrificial giving is a pledge of allegiance. It's a practice that shapes our hearts, but it's also a practice that teaches us to recognize God's good creation. Right after Jesus tells us these strong words about not having two masters, he says, because of all that, don't be anxious about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink, nor about your body, what you'll put on. 
Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And then a few verses later, Why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is today alive and tomorrow thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Now, if we're honest, what Jesus is saying here sounds to us like crazy talk. It doesn't feel like we live in a world where we can stop worrying about how to provide for ourselves and provide for our children. If you're like me, this pandemic has only increased our anxiety. Maybe you are some of the millions of Americans who have experienced job loss or reduction in hours. Maybe this is a time when you're looking out at the world and you're saying, Jesus, I'm not seeing what you're seeing. The world feels like a place where it's dog eat dog, uh, eat or be eaten. The weirdest part, though, of Jesus' words here is not that he calls us to something difficult. It's that he acts like the difficult thing to which he's calling us is so obvious. In other words, he doesn't say, don't worry because I'm commanding you to, and I demand that you not worry. He says, don't worry because it's foolish to. And then he says, look around, look at what the world is like. And it's almost as if when Jesus looks out at the world, he sees a completely different world than the one that I see. When I see a world that is scary and feels dangerous and vulnerable, a world in which I have to compete to make sure that I can be secure. And that's the exact point. Jesus is looking at a different world. He's looking at the world as God's good creation, ruled over by a generous father who promises to provide abundantly for his children. And Jesus is saying, if you see that world, the real world, the world of God's good creation, then the world of scarcity and fear, you will know that the most obvious thing in the world is to seek first my kingdom by practicing radical generosity. And, and the idea here seems to be to me that the only way that we can see creation for what it is, for the generous place of God's provision that creation is for us, the only way we can experience that is if we take our hands off the reins, if we make ourselves vulnerable by investing generously and sacrificially in God's kingdom, having our hearts shaped by that practice, and then discovering now that we see ourselves in the creation that Jesus describes, the creation in which a generous father provides for the lowliest pigeon. And so also will provide for you. But fourth and finally, sacrificial giving is a practice that creates community. You see, ultimately, these teachings come as part of the Sermon on the Mount. This is Jesus' new covenant renewal ceremony where he's drawing his disciples together and saying, these are the characteristics of my kingdom people. And so in the, in the passage so far, it's we who forgive debts. It's we who pray for our daily bread. And even the command with which we began is a command that, as we would say in the South, y'all would store up treasures. Jesus isn't inviting us to a bunch of one-on-one -on -one transactions with God, but to participation in a community of generosity in which our generosity is good news to others and their generosity is good news for us. You see, what Jesus is offering his people is not just a one-on-one -on -one relationship with the God who provides, but membership in a family that shares the good gifts that God gives so that all may have enough. Belonging to that kind of family is good news. And when we pledge our allegiance to King Jesus through radical sacrificial generosity, God uses that practice of generosity to welcome us into a family of generosity, a family of giving and receiving. 
Sacrificial giving, then, is a practice that defines the citizens of the kingdom of Jesus. Through sacrificial giving, we pledge our allegiance to Jesus. We shape our hearts for his kingdom. We learn to see our lives against the backdrop of God's good creation. And we participate in the creation of a new community. But what does that look like for us today? Well, quickly and in closing, if we want to pledge our allegiance to Christ's kingdom and live as citizens characterized by sacrificial generosity, we're going to have to practice generosity with enormous intentionality. We're going to have to learn how to take, take risks. We're going to have to learn how to make ourselves vulnerable, to give until it hurts even. Uh, one way to plan for this kind of giving is the graduated tithe that Ron Sider has been advocating for for decades. The graduated tithe basically says, figure out what percentage you're going to give now and give a percentage that is costly. But then also plan that as your income increases, if your income increases, you actually give an increasingly high percentage of that in income. In other words, build increasing sacrificial giving into your financial life and into your financial plan. Or maybe embrace sacrificial giving by tying it to fasting of some kind. Give up something. Find something that you can do less of to free money for generosity, to invest God's kingdom. Find a way that you can literally stop storing up treasures for your own pleasure on earth and transfer that into the kingdom of God by radical sacrificial sharing. Or maybe consider how to open your hands with some of the money that we have received and likely will receive as a result of this pandemic. If you are some of those blessed ones for whom this pandemic has not led to a job loss, perhaps God is calling us to take the risky step of giving generously with his abundant provision in the form of these checks that we have received. And find ways to give together. What if Bread of Life Church was a place where generosity was something that you talked about when you talked about other aspects of discipleship and following Jesus? What if you were proactively looking for ways to give together as a church? What if you were looking for other bodies of Christians in your city? Maybe churches that are on the other side of racial lines or ethnic lines or economic lines or denominational lines and partnering with them to give sacrificially and generously to take care of the poor and to stand up for justice and to love mercy right there in Ithaca where you are then your practice of generosity would not just lead to others encountering this kingdom of God, but it would build deeper community amidst the fractured body of Christ in your city, perhaps. In all these ways, brothers and sisters, I think that Jesus is standing before us this morning and calling us to give lavishly and to give sacrificially because when we do so, we pledge our allegiance as citizens of his kingdom. We shape our hearts for that kingdom. We open our eyes to live in the good creation that God has provided, and we find ourselves welcomed into a new community. But most importantly of all, when we give, brothers and sisters, when we give, we not only invest in the kingdom of God, but we also receive that kingdom of God in our hearts, in our communities. You see, every act by which we join Jesus in his kingdom is also an act by which he gives the kingdom to us. And so, brothers and sisters, let us worship our ascended Lord. Let us worship our King. Let us live as citizens in his kingdom for our own good, for the good of our neighbor, and for his glory. Amen.